Uh, so please, let's uh, give a warm round of applause for Andrew Blaish and Michael Flossman. All right, fantastic. Cool. Um, thanks so much, everybody, for being here for the last session of the day. This is, uh, this is really exciting to see such a packed room. And we're really excited to be uh, sharing some of our research and um, kind of sharing what we think is uh, a pretty unique insight into a nation state's uh, decision-making process when it comes to actually creating a, uh, a bespoke cyber program. Um, so, yeah, thanks for being here, and uh, we're hoping this should be a pretty interesting and wild talk. Uh, first off, though, who are we? Uh, my name is Michael Flossman. I head up Lookout's threat intelligence team, and I'm joined on stage by Andrew Blaish, who heads up the device intel team. <laughs> and we've got the, the pretty interesting and uh, quite often exciting job of not only looking at different pieces of targeted surveillance where, uh, and understanding how they work, but trying to actually piece together the, the bigger picture and the wider context around their use. So who's behind these tools? Uh, where in the world are they actually deploying them? Who are they going after? How effective are they? And in a lot of cases, we'll actually pull on different threads um, and especially on the infrastructure side, try and identify uh, security mistakes or flaws that allow us to get uh, more information about uh, the motives of those people uh, running these campaigns. So in the past, we've uh, reported on and worked on the analysis of some of the early versions of Pegasus and Cryosaur, so NSO's tools for both iOS and Android, uh, as well as Viper app. Uh, we worked with a really uh, popular and famous t-shirt and sticker company, uh, non-profit, um, that you might uh, know of uh, more from their digital rights side of things, uh, the EFF. Um, so we worked with, all right, shout out, <laughs> great swag, um, great people. And uh, yeah, we, uh, we researched Dark Caracal, which we'll touch on in, uh, in, this, uh, in this session. Um, so in addition to those families, we've looked at uh, malware like Stealth Mango and Tangelo, um, so just a, lot, a, a bunch of random names if you're not familiar with those, but if this sounds like your kind of thing, I definitely recommend checking out our blog and some of our earlier research. Um, so in a lot of this research, we often start with just a single piece of information that might be you know, some IOC, whether it's an IP, a domain, some hash, uh, a unique crypto key that we can kind of uh, pivot off and spider out when it comes to uh, going back to building out that bigger context and getting a deeper understanding of what exactly is going on. Um, so in this talk, uh, a lot of the content that, um, that we're actually able to retrieve ultimately started with just a single malicious Android sample. And this sample caught our attention for several reasons. Uh, the first was that it was clearly written to gather intelligence from mobile devices that it had compromised. Um, and then from our telemetry, we saw that it wasn't being widely deployed at all. In fact, we had no presence uh, on any of our sensors anywhere in the world. So uh, we started to dig further based on that. Uh, so from there, we came across some infrastructure, a uh, single server, and then branched out and found uh, over 20 servers that uh, this attacker was using to support their surveillance campaigns. Um, this is all pretty standard so far. Nothing really interesting. Um, from there, we found that this was a multi-platform actor. Um, so not only did they have a unique Android tool set that they were using, but they also had a custom iOS um, tool that they'd um, created and were deploying. And then in addition to that, they had a, a Windows sample as well. And this is kind of um, surprisingly common. Uh, what we see from a number of different groups is that they're working now to uh, really complement their Windows desktop attack chains and uh, include mobile capabilities as well. Um, so with that in mind, this is still, still pretty standard. Uh, you know, it was definitely interesting to see. Um, but what we did at this point was uh, pull apart all these different uh, malware samples that we had. And through this process, we started to uh, build out a really good understanding of what server-side code might actually look like, um, where interesting files might reside on infrastructure. And we started to make educated guesses around could we retrieve certain pieces of information, 
uh, and in specifically certain pieces of information that might have been stolen from compromised endpoints. And it was in that process that we came across a case of WhatsApp databases. Um, <clears throat> and, and this is also, for the time being, still pretty common uh, in our investigations. That's quite standard for us to actually find exfiltrated content, so data that's been stolen from compromised devices that's actually inadequately secured. So often attackers are really good with their attacker mindset, but you know, defensive security, who cares about that? Uh, which is interesting for us and as researchers and often really helps us out. Um, where this investigation deviated rapidly from a standard one uh, was when we started looking at what was actually in these databases. And what we found that they weren't from a victim, they're actually from a government group that had been tasked with actually creating a, uh, you know, a surveillance program and ultimately what they had done was actually install test versions of this on their own devices. So it's kind of awkward for everybody. It's great for us as researchers. <laughs> but it means their WhatsApp databases from their personal devices were sitting on this infrastructure. And that allowed us to see some really interesting things. Like, for example, they had a $20 million budget to play with to actually create this capability. And they had the choice uh, to either do this internally. So they were thinking about, you know, do we actually have the skill set uh, internally to build this out? Can we do our own exploits? How does that actually tie in with the people that we're targeting? Uh, is, is, that, is this something that's feasible? And then on the flip side, we had them actually engaging to a number of different private sector vendors and actually seeing what's on the market, what's available, how much are different exploits, uh, and does that meet our, our, uh, our requirements? So naturally, in these messages, there are, there are a lot of conversations with a range of different groups, uh, some of them quite high profile and I'm sure recognized by a lot of the people in this room, groups like NSO, Hacking Team, Finn Fisher. Uh, they've managed to, over the years, build quite a reputation uh, in, this, in this space. But then there are also a lot of other groups that we, we didn't really have much of an insight into and um, as Andrew will get to later, we hadn't heard of and uh, they have, they're pretty interesting in themselves. Uh, and not only was there a range of different vendors, they also varied quite significantly in terms of how sophisticated they were. So uh, definitely down towards the lower end of the spectrum, we had groups like Wolf Intelligence, uh, who claim that they're in the same space as NSO Group, but if you look at what's been publicly reported on about them in the past, they've often failed to uh, actually deliver on promised exploits. And there's one shady scenario of where they actually left one of their bodyguards out to dry in a deal that went south in Africa where things started turning hostile. So uh, there's a really fascinating report on that. Um, and yeah, it's, it's kind of scary to see the world these people often play in. So that kind of sets the background of what this session is going to, going to be about. We'll, kick things off by first taking a look at what were the actual requirements for this group, what did they actually need uh, and want in a mobile surveillance capability, um, and also what we see from a no number of other groups. Uh, and then we'll take a look at those actual communications with different vendors, so what exploits are for sale, how much they cost, uh, what were the recommended ways to actually deploy them, uh, which is pretty fascinating for us as researchers to see uh, how this reflects a lot of other um, you know, sales processes. And then, this is a bit of a spoiler, these guys didn't end up creating their own in-house uh, tool, and that was due to a, a several prohibitive reasons that forced them down this path, and they're definitely not the only group. In a lot of our research, we see um, organizations or uh, various threat actors decide to go down the path of either creating a tool internally or uh, buying a low-end, cheaper solution, um, and there can be some uh, pretty unfortunate for them uh, outcomes of having done that, and this is, a, this is a perfect example, I guess. And then we'll wrap things up by actually looking at their, their implants for both iOS and Android, uh, which we've called Stonefish and Barracuda. Um, so when we're often looking at different investigations and different malware families, quite often we find ourselves asking the questions why did these actors go down a certain route? Why did they choose to implement certain malicious capabilities over others? 
um, why they're using phishing and not relying on any exploits. So these messages allowed us to get more context and color around those, those kinds of decisions. And uh, it was really interesting to see that um, many of these decisions are determined like any other engineering organization. Um, so you've got you know, budgetary constraints. Even in this case, it's 23 million. Um, I think you could do a lot with that. Uh, but then you also had things like time constraints, uh, as well as internal expertise that might not match up with what you needed. Uh, so, for example, these guys uh, were quite, quite clear around stating that they didn't think they had enough expertise internally when it came to creating exploits, um, but it's something that they could loop in later on down the line, train people up on that skill set, and then feed like, those exploit writing skill sets back, uh, back into these tools that we'll talk about. Then I think also in combination with this, it's a matter of seeing obviously what's on the market. Is there something that can easily uh, fill my need as a buyer? Um, just like any sort of other marketplace. And then ultimately it's what do we want to achieve? Uh, are, are our targets actually active on certain endpoints uh, or certain environments or platforms? Um, and with that in mind, should we even target a mobile uh, device? So that's one of the, the big initial questions that we see from a lot of these players. Uh, in terms of why should I even have a mobile uh, surveillance capability. Um, you know, and particularly for a government group, you'd think they might have already some sort of human capability, uh, probably some sort of desktop capability. Can't they just rely on that to gather the intelligence that they want? And I'm sure it comes as no surprise to everyone in this room, but you think of the actual functionality that your, your mobile device provides you with, there's just, there's, like, it'd be crazy to think of a, a higher nation state not having a capability for a, for a mobile device, given the wealth of data that you can get uh, from these things. Um, and definitely on the research side, when we come across uh, infrastructure that has data that's been stolen, it's actually pretty frightening to see uh, what these actors can retrieve and you know, how much that information can be used to gain a really deep and rich insight into uh, target lives and be used to further profile those victims. Um, it's also kind of frightening to see what people use their phones for. Um, some things, you know, shouldn't be photographed. Uh, yeah, so... <laughs> so, yeah, please don't photograph things. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, and then kind of going off of those different capabilities that these actors can leverage, you know, they can record audio um, from either when you make a call or just from the surrounding audio. They can get your text messages. Um, or track your location, wherever you are. Um, and then all of this is really publicly accessible. So the, the, the technical skills required to implement this is surprisingly easy. You can just go to Stack Overflow, for the most part, GitHub, and then incorporate that functionality into your, into your tooling. So not really challenging. Uh, we have seen some actors, and in this case, it does apply where they want some sort of custom capability, like they want, might want uh, messages for certain secure messaging applications um, retrieved by their implant. Uh, for example, messages sent by Signal, Telegram, WhatsApp, that sort of thing. So I think once an actor has actually identified the kinds of capabilities that they want in their tooling, they then need to consider, do they actually want to play in the exploit game? Um, does their target's uh, security awareness actually mean that they need uh, to invest in this space. Uh, and more often than not, we see a lot of people not taking this route or making modifications to publicly available exploits and kind of going from there. Uh, depending how much money you have, as we'll see, you can buy a premium zero-day tool and uh, you can even buy premium access to it so it's exclusively yours uh, for, for its lifetime and for as long as you're willing to, to essentially pay for it. And when, when an adversary actually identifies the, the exploits that, um, that, they're, that they're actually planning to use, then that opens up the different attack vectors that, uh, that are available to them. So, for example, uh, a lot of groups, even if they are more sophisticated, they get a lot of mileage out of the phishing side of things. And we see this time and time again. Uh, it's just low cost, easy. Um, you can try it as many times as you want, and your zero-day tooling is, you know, is never going to get burnt by that route. Uh, it's potentially noisier. Um, and then what we've seen from other groups is that often they'll actually have the ability to do physical access at some point. So 
uh, retrieve a uh, individual's mobile device when it's out of their control and quickly throw an implant on their device and then you know, uh, leverage all these different capabilities that are at their disposal to kind of completely get a rich insight into their life. And then on the other end of the spectrum, all the way down the bottom, if they wanted, they could actually do, as we'll see, uh, like a zero-click uh, exploit and completely remove the user from their attack chain. In the case of this group, uh, they were pretty clear in, in what they wanted to actually go after. They were interested in just getting uh, primarily the secure messaging content from a lot of um, different applications like WhatsApp, uh, Telegram, WeChat, as well as Viber. So before they actually started to assess the viability of, their, of actually creating this internally, they decided to actually bring a lot of these vendors to one of their main cities and, and you know, showcase what they had on sale, uh, the different exploits that they have, and uh, for that part, just going to hand over to Andrew, who will walk us through some of the more interesting things. Thanks, Mike. Um, yeah, so with that, all that lead in right now, so we got into a lot of the vendors that they were um, either talking with, had seen demos from, or that were considering to provide their tooling. So there's a, there's a grouping of a different, as Michael talked about, a grouping of a different types of technologies that are here, right? So you have um, companies that are experts in um, creating package solutions that contain zero-day exploits, malware implants, and also command and control infrastructure that allows them to monitor them and then also collect that data and allow the person who's using it in order to view and access that data as well. Um, so things that you would get from NSO or FinFish or a hacking team would kind of fall into those examples. Um, you have some pure exploit development companies, um, you know, things like Verint that is um, pretty popular and well-known. Um, the lesser-known stuff that we talked about, like Wolf Intelligence is in the game, essentially looking at um, trying to provide similar solutions that you would get from the big-name players, but um, kind of lower cost, and that was attractive to the buyers as well to see maybe we can get the same thing at a lower cost to kind of meet our budget needs. Uh, but then you had some other stuff like Expert Team, which, which basically creates like um, inline traffic decryption solutions that you would put a box on your network in order to see the secure messages going across, whether it's secure or not secure, um, through HTTP and HTTPS. Uh, and then you had some interesting companies that popped out like, um, you know, Esvav uh, and Arity, which um, two different types of companies that don't really have a website or a web presence mostly. Um, and one is particular um, down at the bottom, which we'll get into, that was um, trying to sell a number of exploits, and even the buyers were skeptical whether this was a real group or not. And so that's, that gets into some interesting stuff as well around that. Uh, but then you even had them looking also more broadly at, let's look at what we can do in terms of how do we process a lot of data and OS and capabilities and stuff. And that's why they were also considering things like Palantir solutions and stuff like that, which is why they're up there um, as well. So one of the first big ones that we came in the data was um, FinFisher um, pretending to, uh, not pretending, they were um, selling a, um, a zero-click iOS compromise. Um, what's interesting is zero-click meaning um, they would send the exploit to the phone as long as iMessage was enabled and the user would have to have no, do, do no interactions and the phone would be exploited, the implants would be placed on the device in that case. Um, this stood out to us because it's very interesting obviously because it's iOS and at the time that this, we were looking at these messages, our, the messages were sent this was the latest versions of iOS at the time, so iOS 10, so they said they covered all the new versions of iOS 10, including the latest betas that were there that they had been testing against, and all the, the most recent devices that were there as well, the iPhones and the iPads and things like that. Um, all of the vendors, as we'll get into, essentially have, um, they provide like, how would you attack this, how would you send this down, what's your infection vector, but also in some cases they'll provide um, hints or ways and the best way to deploy this. Um, do it at night or do it in such a way where the user may not see it. Um, that we'll see a little bit as well. Um, what stood out to us, the zero-click iOS compromise, was a lot, this, this sort of um, exploit and, and a package solution has often been rumored about. So when we were first investigating Pegasus back in 2016, there was always the notion that NSO had the same type of capabilities, but it required special export licenses in order for someone to use it. Um, but it was rumored to be there. So when we saw this, and actually there were some details around what this is, that was very interesting to show that other companies also have the capabilities that are trying to sell this fairly advanced um, attack against uh, mobile devices out there. Um, you know, as we move into that, you know, there was some demos that this group had seen from NSO, similar vein kind of to what we saw before with the um, iOS zero click. Uh, it was a flash SMS mobile compromise. Um, it, this was probably, in this case, this demo was probably meant for Android, but it's not clear what the platform wasn't specified in the messaging. Um, but essentially, they would send a message down and the SMS service on the Android phone or the iPhone, it's unclear what it was, would be compromised. 
um, which then would end up launching the browser to go visit a site, download the implant and exploits. Um, in this case, this is actually where they gave some deployment recommendations where it's best to do this at night because it's likely that the phone's going to turn on, the browser's going to open up, and you know, if, you, if your user's actively using this, they might freak out and be like, oh, what this is, and it's not going to be very silent. So in those cases, the, um, their recommendation is to do it at night, likely when the, um, the target is sleeping in some cases like that. And so this kind of shows you know, what they want to do with that. And there's some of these recommendations playing a little bit later where we'll see where um, obviously the seller doesn't want to burn all these um, zero days as well because that's bad for them and for their business. So they want to make sure that the people that are buying this are being responsible, as responsible as one could be when they're sending zero days to a target. <laughs> um, so um, and to kind of round out some of the mobile zero days that we saw um, in the messaging, this was one of the ones from the Already Group, um, which is supposedly an Estonia-based company. Um, unclear. But in this case, they were um, trying to promote uh, an RCE for Android that would attack media server, uh, but not specifically lib stage fright, which a lot of news in the past years has been about, but a different part of the media server, essentially. So they could send a, probably a corrupted video file down that either through MMS, either you visit it through a browser or via mail client or whatever mechanism would get the phone to render, try to render the bad video file um, would essentially compromise that. And so they provide some other information about it bypasses ASLR, if that's a concern for you, which it is, because you want to get your implant on the phone. Um, and then it gives a little more details about what it is and potentially what it is not affecting. But as with all zero days, it says it tests up to the point in time where it was the latest version of Android at that time as well. And the types of devices, and especially in Android, is very important to mention which type of devices this works on. Because as we know with the fragmentation, not everything's going to work across all the different versions and all the different hardware as well. So you basically have to have that itemized list out. Uh, and in this case, though, we actually got some pricing which was $90,000 that they were selling for, and we believe this was probably just for the exploit itself, not like a, a, a whole package solution like you would get with a Finn Fisher or an NSO sort of situation, uh, which is probably why the price is a little bit lower. Um, this is just the exploit itself that they would um, be selling you. Um, and then in the same vein, there was some desktop stuff as well um, at the time, zero days that they were showing for. In this case, this was one for Internet Explorer and also Edge in order to escape the sandbox and get an RCE on there in order to um, take over the um, take over the desktop. Um, with these, though, with the desktop ones, we actually have um, demo videos that the seller sent um, to show kind of how it works, um, to show that, like, there's no detections if you try to run it. Um, I guess so this is kind of, sorry for the green screen. It was a conversion from a different type video type. Uh, but basically, the seller is showing on their screen, um, hey, I'm going to load a web page. I'm going to click this link. Um, and then I'm going to pop calculator, which is a popular technique when you're showing um, an exploit on a, de on a desktop machine that you can run an, an external process out of the, um, the sandbox um, application. So in those cases, then they talk about, okay, once you're able to do this, then you can go and download other implants and do other things on the phone because now you've compromised the system in those cases. Um, sorry. In the next, I think the video is still playing. Let's go next. Right. So. In the next one, there was a Flash um, zero day because there's lots of exploits for Flash, and that's why everyone's trying to get off of Flash, um, one of the many reasons. Uh, so this was another RCE that was in Flash um, that could compromise the entire system, obviously, and they, they talked about testing it within all the browsers as well. So any browser, as long as it had Flash in there, would enable this to work. Um, what's interesting about the next video is they actually show... Um, um, they have some security software on there to show that, hey, this security software doesn't detect this. This is great. This is why you should go and buy it because they're not detecting it. And they show you that all, everything's checked on. It's enabled. Um, what's interesting with that is it's kind of the reverse. That, like if you're in a security company, you show that you can detect everything. And in this case, they're showing that no, security is not detected. So it's kind of the exact opposite that you would have um, kind of by the seller showing which product would be better in those cases. So in this case, the attackers were show, the, um, the sellers were showing um, Kaspersky, that was their chosen um, security software at the time, um, showing that it has the latest definition updates. They'll actually do an update to make sure that they have everything, but also showing that all the appropriate switches are enabled so that there's nothing up their sleeves. They're not tricking you. Um, we're running this exploit, and it's not being detected, so this is another reason why you should go ahead and try to buy this um, from us. And so it's downloading, making sure it has the latest definition files um, f from the servers for the thing. So run through it for a second. Um, it's not that long once it downloads. Um, and then it's kind of similar to what we saw with the IE and the Edge one, where they'll launch a web page, um, and then they'll show some information about the exploit um, in terms of what system it's running on so that you get an idea of what it works on. Um, and then kind of they'll pop calc again to show you that, hey, look, we can do this sort of thing. This is what our exploit enables us to do. And so there's some details about that. And there you go. Let's see. 
okay. Um, what also was interesting with Arity is there was some more details. So there was a lot of back and forth with the, um, the sellers and the buyers with this one where they had some, a lot of this information was contained in the WhatsApp messages and other stuff that they had copy and pasted between emails into their messaging system as well. Um, this was an interesting insight where we imagine probably other companies have this as well, but they basically um, offer exclusive access to the zero day that you're buying for, in this case, they're offering 40 day guarantee that no one, we won't sell this to anyone else. Um, and then also they had an interesting piece where uh, there's a guaranteed replacement. So if someone were to patch this in 30 days of you buying it, they will offer you another exploit potentially, uh, but not potentially for the same product you bought it for, just that it will give you another exploit, which depending on what you're building may not actually be useful for you, but it's interesting to see they have this kind of buyer guarantee um, if that is. However, they won't do that for you if you do something stupid, which they called out where they had a situation supposedly where they mass mail, someone mass mailed an exploit to a large enterprise, to a lot of people, and it got caught very quickly because you want to keep suspicious with this, but they were very noisy when they sent it off, so they kind of give this warning. If you do something dumb like that and we find out, deals off essentially. We're not going to give you a new exploit because it, it got patched. So we thought that was interesting. So moving away from kind of the zero day exploits and some of the other technology we saw them working about was net network traffic interception. And so these were some slides that they had taken from expert team. Um, it's kind of what you would expect from an inline box that would do um, traffic decryption. So, you know, being able to look, being able to allow or block um, content from a variety of different services and websites and messaging apps that might be going across on the network wherever this box might be placed. You know, if you're, in, if you're a nation state that controls the cellular networks and all the network infrastructure, you can put these anywhere and basically intercept all the capabilities. Um, and they, but one of the things, if you're familiar with network traffic interception, is um, HTTPS, right? You need a certificate in order to negotiate. And so they talk a bit about that as a warning, saying they can get past that, um, but there's a little warning probably down there where there's some caveats to how that happens. So you either need a government-trusted root CA. Um, if you're not familiar on your phones, there's a lot of government-trusted root CAs on there. You have several hundred of them on your phone. Um, we have some past research if you're interested in learning more about that. But if you're in a country that has a government-trusted root CA, this makes it easier for them to put this box on decrypt traffic. Um, but if you don't, they recommend an underground root CA. So that could be anything from um, convincing someone to install their own self-signed root CA that they've issued out. Um, that no one else has, or potentially we theorize that if they have a compromise or a backdoor into one of the hundreds of CAs that are out there, they'll get a cert issued for the services that you want to decrypt, and then they'll get you to put that cert on the box and everything will be great and work correctly as well. So we thought that was pretty interesting to add on top of all of this other mobile stuff that they're also interested in decrypting traffic that may not be specifically on any endpoint, but just is traveling across the network itself. Now, one final thing we thought was interesting was we were happy to see the vendors are actually reading our research. Um, for good or bad, they were, um, one seller was trying to make a sell um, that was saying, hey, you know, we found out NSO had another one of their products discovered, and actually that was work that we had done at Lookout. Um, and so they posted a link to an article on Forbes. Uh, and so the buyer's like, I'm confused how they found this. And the seller's like, you know, anyone can find out anything, you know, but we did not write this article, this wasn't us. Um, but please, you know, you should probably not consider them for your product. So it's interesting to kind of see sellers, as you would find kind of in the sale chain, trying to get um, you to not buy other people's products and buy your own product as well. So kind of the, if you're familiar with sales or anything, those same techniques are very um, evident and happening in this world as well of exploit selling and surveillanceware um, marketplaces, for sure. And then I'll hand off the mic to talk a little bit about um, what could go wrong if you decide to actually do your own surveillanceware. Yeah. Many, many things. Sorry. Um, yeah, so, so we just saw, I guess, all the different options that were thrown at this potential customer or this prospective buyer. And as I mentioned earlier, they ultimately decided to go down the route of internally developing this themselves. And that was for a number of different reasons. Um, they found that this, this market was really cost prohibitive. That was probably one of the biggest things. You know, some of these solutions uh, were several million dollars in this case. Um, yeah, several million dollars, but in this case, seven. Um, and what they found was that despite these exorbitant price tags, uh, they didn't actually match all those capabilities that we looked at earlier. So there's kind of a capability gap in that uh, this was only for WhatsApp, but they were interested in a number of other messaging applications as well. Um, and then in addition to that, they also had to um, kind of fight with exploit management and you're actually tuning and tweaking exploits for different uh, target environments, which as I mentioned earlier, wasn't something they had a lot of skill in. Uh, so um, with that in mind, 
they, they ultimately decided to in-house develop and I think a lot of these reasons kind of play into the decision making process of a number of other actors out there when they go through this process. Um, <clears throat> so I'll just touch on a few of those that we've looked at in the past. Um, Dark Caracal is a really good example um, that we worked on with the EFF in, in terms of just completely uncovering. And what we found is that they uh, relied on publicly available uh, code to build out a really uh, effective but low sophistication tool. Um, but despite this low sophistication, we saw them pull um, you know, over 80 gigabytes worth of data from both Windows uh, and, and mobile devices. So still highly effective. Um, ultimately, what they did was uh, buy a, uh, a low cost solution. And kind of like what we saw with this actor, and that we'll, we'll go back to in just a second, uh, is that um, that low sophistication resulted in us being able to identify a number of different personas uh, tied to this group and ultimately track them back to a certain building and floor in downtown Beirut that ended up being the Lebanese intelligence agency, uh, the General Directorate of General Security. Uh, definitely not the, the only actor that's kind of gone down the path of you know, rolling their own solution or buying a low-end solution. In this case, with Stealth Mango and Tangelo, uh, these guys actually modified a, or worked with a group and obtained a solution that was a modified spouseware tool um, and kind of customized that for their needs. And if you're unfamiliar with spouseware, it's uh, like tooling that's advertised as something you would install on your loved one's device because you care about them. Uh, <laughs> probably too much and in a creepy way. Uh, <laughs> But that aside, um, when we look at the, the modified version that this group was using, uh, they were really effective in its deployment. Um, so they obtained a lot of information in regional deployments uh, throughout the Middle East and Pakistan, India. Uh, but then also, based on who their targets were, they were able to obtain a lot of information from uh, Western secondary targets. So there were people of interest um, sending content to these compromised targets. Uh, so, for example, there was a letter from U.S. Central Command uh, that was caught up in the expo, along with um, a lot of other data. So, low sophistication, uh, still highly successful. Um, and, and then, you know, there's just kind of a number of other examples with Viperat, which was a targeted uh, malware family being used exclusively against the Israeli Defense Force. Uh, it was in-house developed, no, like, low-end solution purchased. And these guys felt they had the skills to actually do this all themselves. Um, but what we found is that, you know, kind of similar to this group we're talking about, they had a lot of operational security mistakes that exposed a lot of data that they had uh, taken. Um, and ultimately, it showed that they had a really rich insight into military members of the IDF. So, you know, where they were being deployed to, where they were doing their training, where they went on holidays, who their friends were. Uh, so, um, yeah. Kind of, kind of scary to see just how in-depth their intelligence gathering was from just a purely in-house developed solution. And it's not only those lower-end solutions that are susceptible to this kind of stuff. I think everyone here is familiar with both Hacking Team uh, and uh, Finn Fisher and the fact that both those companies were compromised by uh, a hacker going by the name of Phineas Fisher that exposed a lot of data about um, customers, email logs, uh, tooling, and uh, you know, that, that pretty much blew these organizations wide open and provided researchers with such a deep insight into how these tools work, how we can track them, and uh, what signatures to kind of look for and what anomalies um, can, uh, can lead us to identify those newer samples. Yeah, so that, so that brings us to... Um we talked about the low end, we talked about the exploits, we talked about the low end stuff, and this, this brings us to what they ended up at least initially making for their short term needs. And so they um, developed two in house solutions, um, known as Stonefish and Barracuda, we're calling them, so iOS and Android. Um, basically, custom malware they built um, with the help of some open source tooling, which we'll get into in a second. Um, but that also includes any other associated tooling they had to build. So in some cases, there's specific desktop tooling they needed to achieve their purposes with the malware. Um, but what we can see is it it's, was fairly effective for their needs, especially in the short term. Um, 
they've been able to grab at least 50 gigabytes of data or more um, as they turn, continue to expand out. And that's, that's pretty good, though, because what this, this, is a, this stuff is used in highly targeted scenarios. It's not sent out in mass to a lot of people. It's used in very specific scenarios. Um, so like one sample might be used for one target. Um, but they've been able to get a lot of data from that. And so we've also seen a lot of variants that they've developed. So we've seen at least 400 types of um, instances of both Stonefish and I or iOS, bleh, Stonefish and Barracuda. Um, which consists of both testing um, apps when they're building it up, but also stuff that's been used in targeting, we believe, as well. Um, they also, but they also chose to, as we talked about, not to use any exploits at this time, simply a kind of a trojanized app or an app like on Android that's overly permissive in order to just request all the data. And if you accept that, the app's going to say, thank you very much. Let me take all that all and send it off to who's requesting it. Um, but what's also interesting, as we'll see, is there's physical access, but also phishing involved as well with these attacks. So first off, for the iOS tooling capabilities, um, kind of four key pieces that make up how they're able to do what they would do with iOS. And we'll get into the flow in a second. But they use pre-cracked apps. So on iOS, all of the apps that you get from the App Store have DRM on them. So the, um, the Mako binary is essentially encrypted. And you have to crack that DRM to do anything with that. Um, and, and also have to re-sign it with your signing cert in order for it to be used. So they went, um, it didn't seem like they had the capabilities to use it themselves. So they actually went and downloaded pre-cracked versions of the apps they were targeting from repos online. There's a lot of sources online where you can go and get these from. So um, they went and got those and then used those. And so this, additionally, they had an iOS developer account. Um, you need an iOS developer account to sign and get anything to run on, a, on an iPhone or an iPad. Um, so they went and purchased one. Um, what's interesting is they chose not to go for the more expensive option, which would be like the enterprise one, which they get their own cert, lasts for a couple years. Um, they went for the cheaper developer solution for $100. Um, but we believe they're doing this in order to um, um, specifically target specific device ID. So they'll get the device ID, they'll provision the app specifically for that phone. And what that does is it actually hides the provisioning profile on the phone itself so the user doesn't really know if um, this is the real version of WhatsApp or not because the profile is hiding at least from the UI. And we believe that's what they're doing in this case here. Um, they also borrowed a number of tools from open source repos. So one of the ways they did in order to trojanize the iOS app is they used an open source project called PP Sideloader. Um, this uses two techniques. It uses something called Cydia Substrate, which if you're familiar with iOS jailbreaking is a popular tool that's used to make changes to your iOS device, but also to hook um, different apps on the phone in order to um, extract data or manipulate processes. Bypass jailbreak detection is pretty popular also with Substrate. Um, but because Substrate's running in the process of this app, it allows the attacker to um, essentially hook the functions within the app that it's occupying. So that's where this um, dialib that they inject in that contains all of their malicious code, all their spying code, um, where they hook the specific functions to grab the messaging databases and the contacts and everything like that. And then essentially within that dialib, they'll then exfiltrate the data up to their C2s and infrastructure. And then finally, which will make sense in a second, they have desktop tooling. Why do they have desktop tooling? Um, they want to create a backup of your phone in order to extract the databases of the apps they're going to replace on your phone. So if you have WhatsApp on your phone and they get physical access to your phone, they want to put a trojanized version of WhatsApp on there. So what that means is they'll take the backup, they'll extract the WhatsApp databases from that backup, and then they'll inject those databases back into the application that's being trojanized and then send that app back down to the device. Um, and then the, when the app comes up and they set it up again because they have physical access so they can get the two-factor auth codes, set everything up, delete their trace, um, the app will now come up and the user that gets their phone back will be like, okay, everything's fine, great, all my messages are here, looks good to me. Um, we thought that was a pretty unique um, technique they used in order to get over a lot of the other hurdles to get malware onto the device itself. That me method they did use, though, is kind of how we got access to all the databases that we talked about before, where they were using this on their own personal phones for testing devices and were backing up their messaging databases to the system in order for us to look at um, to the other way. So I kind of walked through that already, but the flow essentially is they would get physical access to the iPhone. Um, in some cases, we believe they could also send this out as a phishing link. They wouldn't get the backed up database messages, but uh, you could at least get the Trojanized app onto the device itself. But essentially, you know, physical access, they would plug it into their backup machine, the backup would get created. Um, it would get all sent to a server, which would essentially kind of do what you consider like wrapping it all together, right? So it would take the app, whether the user's requesting WhatsApp or Viber or Telegram, um, inject the different databases that are requested into that if they were in the backup, um, then talk to Apple servers to sign the application. That's kind of just how app signing works in general. Um, and then they would get a URL delivered back from their signings, uh, from the um, provisioning server that the attacker controls that says, go to this URL on the phone and that will install the application for you. 
Uh, and also within the tooling, they have a lot of interesting information about, you know, if you're doing this, make sure um, uh, once you put the application on, delete your browser history so that the user doesn't know the URL's there. Um, if you request a two-factor auth code if it's needed for the application you're um, putting on there, delete that message as well so the user doesn't know that a request was made. So it was kind of interesting to see all that stuff um, go on there as well in terms of how they evolve and as they evolve this tooling as well. So during the cost of the investigation, um, they evolved the tooling through different versions of the tooling as well um, to add to and add remove different types of functionality based on what they were finding was working and wasn't working um, in essence. But the tooling also was built so that they could ship it to different groups depending on who's using it and then that can arbitrarily um, provision to any sort of different C2 server they would want to provision it through just through the, um, the tooling itself. Um, yeah, and that leads kind of to what the Android side looked like. Cheers. Yeah, so surprise, surprise, uh, Android was much easier. Um, <laughs> thanks, Android. Uh, so, um, you know, these guys in creating this tool, they didn't have to worry about doing all that fancy sort of stuff in order to actually get their implant on a device. Um, and that came down to the fact that when, when we're actually installing an application on a device, uh, it does need to be signed, but it can be self-signed. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, a target device might need to have third-party installs enabled. Uh, but what we see quite often from actors is that they're, they're continually trying to get their tools into the Play Store to uh, kind of take out this extra, extra step that users might have to go through uh, when these... Um, when these tools or surveillance, when, when the surveillance ware is basically being deployed and pushed out um, to devices of interest. So in the case of uh, Barracuda, their Android version, um, we haven't seen actual um, evidence of this, but based on their technical skill sets, we believe, uh, and what they're doing on the iOS side, we believe what they're doing uh, for the Android piece is quite similar in terms of you know, leveraging that physical access uh, to then install uh, the surveillance ware, or you know, taking use of the, the phishing route, uh, which is low cost but still really effective uh, in terms of delivering this, and then kind of going back to the whole third party install um, uh, side of things. Uh, so um, it, it wouldn't surprise us basically down the line to see this uh, or see the actors behind it, um, like other groups, trying to sneak it into the Play Store um, to, make it, uh, to make it easier to get onto target devices. Uh, and then, you know, both the, the Android piece and the iOS piece both talk to same servers. Um, and in, in terms of exfiltrated data, if we go back to those capabilities that we saw at the start, it's, uh, it's all pretty standard sort of stuff. So we're, they decided to go beyond just uh, getting messages from those secure messaging applications. And we can see it was, you know, trivial for them to implement functionality to record audio, uh, get browser history, do key logging, push down second stages, uh, and in one case actually use accessibility services to uh, scrape the screen. Um, so they do, I suppose they can rely on a super user binary being present to give them you know, more access to a system, but in most cases they simply don't just need, they, they don't need it, they can get away with uh, just using whatever permissions they have to uh, access all this information, um, yeah. <coughs> So in terms of what that information looked like on the C2 uh, and how we're actually able to uncover a lot of it, uh, we found that this group was actually encrypting all of it uh, on the device and then sending it up to the servers and it had a really unique uh, structure. They gave the start of it a, uh, you know, a, a header that basically said this, this chunk of data is encrypted, you know, pass to the decryption module and you know, uh, take things from there. Um, following that, we've got the AES initialization vector that's used. And then after that is just the, um, the encrypted content. So since we have most of the pieces of the puzzle here, we can actually pull apart their implants and figure out what they're using for the secret key. And that turns out to be the last 16 bytes of a unique identifier that, they're, um, that is generated on each compromised device. So now that we have those pieces, we can actually start to you know, trawl automate the process of decrypting this and uh, you know, uh, start looking through uh, those messages that are basically being stolen. Um, so uh, we can see that it's not, um, I suppose, just backtracking a bit. Uh, so once we de decrypt this data, we can see that uh, it's essentially file metadata at the top. It's a JSON object that contains information about what device it came from. Uh, so 
uh, that'll contain things like the IME, the IMSI, the locale, uh, as well as you know, additional metadata like the file name uh, of the actual uh, content that was taken, what data type it was, um, whether the system that it was operating on was Android or iOS, is it rooted? Um, so lots of data there, and then at the end, the remaining, remainder of the content is just the raw file, so in this case, it's an audio recording. Yeah, so we, we can see that this group uh, implemented a number of different capabilities in, in their surveillance program uh, and in the implants that they created, and they're certainly not alone uh, when, it comes to, uh, when it comes to rolling your own or buying a low-end solution, so we've seen from a number of those other groups and the different, um, the different tools that they created or they purchased, a lot of this functionality is, is the same. Uh, and the same can be said for what's being on offer and what's being sold by these, uh, these premium vendors. The main differentiator that we see uh, is definitely those, those exploits that are gonna dictate how you actually can go about delivering these tools and compromising devices of interest. Uh, so we thought that was pretty interesting to see and um, uh, definitely showed a lot of similarities between uh, both sides and kind of where you expect uh, adversaries to change um, uh, and I guess the exploits that they may incorporate into their attacks based on a number of different factors uh, that we've highlighted in this talk. So uh, you might be wondering um, who's actually uh, behind all this because we haven't mentioned it, and um, we have several reasons for that. Uh, one is that we're continuing to uh, continuing to track this actor, uh, and we do plan on uh, releasing a part two, uh, so stay tuned for that. We're, we're uh, really excited to uh, re release that at some point in the future as well. Uh, yeah, uh, so that's pretty much it. Um, you can follow us on Twitter or catch us after the talk to ask us any questions, uh, but yeah, thanks. Yeah, thank you guys.